Chapter Thirty Two of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Thirty Two, Jason in the Way. Jason had lighted a candle and made himself comfortable in the settle. Pepperell stood staring at him in speechless anger and uncertainty. "Where's the sister? Where's Kitty?" asked Jason in unconcern. "What are you doing here?" roared Pasco, convulsed with sudden rage. "'Is this your house, that you dare to come in and use it as your home?' Quorum looked at his brother-in-law in surprise. "'Get out of the place at once!' shouted Pasco. "'If I happen to get away for ten minutes, is that a reason for every Jack and Tom to come here, as if it was Beggar's Hall?' "'Why, what on earth has put you out?' "'What has put me out? You, by coming here!' This is my house, not yours. Brother-in-law, said Jason, puzzled at the strange humor of Pasco, is not that a sufficient answer, when I give you that title? Zara is my sister. I've ever been welcome here. Kate is my daughter. She lives with you. Why am I here? Put it. I have come to see my sister, come to kiss my child. Neither is in the house. "'Then where are they?' "'I am not bound to answer you,' shouted Pepperell, in anger, vexation, and fear, aggravated by the coolness with which Quarm answered him. "'Yes, you are. I have ties of blood and ties of affection. Your bad temper can't snap. I ask, where is my daughter?' "'Gone back to the moor.' "'That can't be, alone. She is not alone.' Is Zira with her? No, she is not. Zira's at Tynemouth, gone there to get me out of one of the difficulties into which you have plunged me. I? I got you into difficulties. I am always showing you rope's ends by which you may crawl out. Or who else but yourself has now put me in such an upsetment that I do not know under what stone to look for money, that I am threatened with legal proceedings, that the bailiffs are on their way to my house? It is your own doing, not mine. Who threatens you? There is my bill for the wool unmet. There is my account for coals unpaid. I have had to do with neither. You acted like a fool about Coker's wool, buying when in all the papers it was told how there had been an importation from New South Wales. I never read the papers. Then you have no right to do business. You do it at inevitable loss. But this is neither here nor there, above nor below. Where is Kate? I have told you, gone to the moor. When? An hour or two ago. With whom? With me. Then how came you here? Because I had left the doors unlocked against impertinent fellows coming in. I left Kate with the trap whilst I ran back. Now, are you content? "'Out of my house, immediately. "'I want to lock up and go back to her.' "'This is a queer tale,' said Quorum. "'I have myself but just arrived. "'I must have passed you on the way.' "'Not at all, if we had gone into a friend's for a cup of tea.' "'With what friends were you?' "'I shall not stand by and be catechized by you. "'I say, get out. "'I am going to lock up.' "'Now look here.' Pasco, and be reasonable. I would not have returned to Coombe and left the men at Dartmead unlooked after, had I not good news to communicate. Good news, mocked Pepperell. The best of news would be that you are going to take yourself off. I believe we shall sell the oak. I have heard of that already, from Coker. Well, I tell you it is so. The authorities at Portsmouth will take it at a reasonable price if we will deliver it. There is the thing we can't do. That spoils it all. Yes, we can. Delivered here at the Tyne. There is the Stover Canal. We can send it down by that, and ship it all the way to Portsmouth right away. Pepperell was silent. This was indeed a rift in the cloud. The only difficulty is not this. It is that we must have the timber sawn at Brimps, and send it down and put on board in planks, they cannot freight a vessel with rude oaken timber unsawn. Now, I have a scheme. 
There is the river Dart, pouring down its volumes of water of no good to any one. Let us put up a sawmill, and we shall have the oak run into planks and ready for transport in a jiffy. And the cost? Forty pounds. Forty pounds, roared Pasco, and thrust quorum from him by a rude stroke on the shoulder. Where am I to look for forty pence? It is our only chance. I must agree to-morrow, or the thing is off. If I engage to saw up the timber and dispatch it by water, we shall get a very tidy profit. Not what we had hoped, but something. If I do not accept the offer, then I really do not see my way to disposing of the oak at all. The felling of the Oakhampton Park oaks has spoiled the market in this country. Come, what say you, Pasco? Shall I settle? I cannot do it, answered Pepperell, a cold sweat breaking out over his brow. There is an old mine wheel available. I can buy it for a song, said Quorm. I have no money. Have I not told you that? Or must I knock it into your brain with my fist, or the house key? He raised his hand threateningly. Be reasonable, Pasco. I cannot tell what has come over you tonight. You are not yourself. If you do not care about the outlay for a sawmill, we must saw up all by hand, and that will come costlier in the end. I fancy if you bestirred yourself, you could raise a loan. I will not. I will have but one thing now. Your absence. Get out of my house. Where be I to go? asked Quorm, settling himself from one leg to the other. There's Jane Redmore in my cottage with all her children. Well? I can't go there. The place is full. You are a fool to have suffered it. Kate begged and prayed of me. Take the consequences, and be homeless. I cannot, for to-night. You are going to Brimps, and it is as well the men should see you. I shall return to-morrow, but to-night I must house me somewhere. Let me stay here. There is no one in the place, and I'll keep guard for you, if you wish. There is nothing here to guard but emptiness. I want no help of yourn. But I must have a roof over my head at night. Any roof but mine— Will you go, or must I fling you out and down the steps? You're in a wonderful queer temper tonight. What is up? My temper, as you say, is up, and like to be so, when it is through you I am brought to ruin and beggary. He caught Jason by the shoulders, whirled him round, and with hands and knees thrust him out of the door, and then he slammed it behind him and turned the key. Next moment he blew out the light. Then he threw himself panting on the settle and buried his head in his hands. He had not sat there many minutes before Quorm was kicking at the door and calling him by name. Transported with anger, Pasco sprang to his feet, took down the blunderbuss that was over the kitchen fire, and going to the door, half opened it and thrust forth the muzzle of his piece. "'Go away, or I will shoot. "'This is rank folly,' bawled Jason. Are you gone demented? Give me shelter for the night. I will do no harm. What do you mean by refusing me such a reasonable request? I tell you I can't go home. All the Redmores are there packing every corner. Jason threw up the end of the blunderbuss and put his shoulder to the door. I'll kill you if you trouble me further, said Pasco between his teeth. Take the consequences of befriending scoundrels and their families. He drove Quorum back and refastened the door. Then he stood at the door listening, with the butt of the gun on his foot. He heard his brother-in-law growl and pass remarks upon him. He heard him limp away, and then all was still. Pepperell stepped to a window and looked out, to observe the direction taken by Quorum, but the darkness was too great for him to see anything. He went back to the settle and tried to think. The elaborate precautions he had taken to dissemble his return, to make believe that he had departed before sunset, had been made futile by the appearance of Jason on the scene. Should what he proposed take place, then he could not declare that he had been from home at the time. What availed it that he had paid the miller's bill at a quarter to seven, when his brother-in-law could aver that he had been back at the cellars an hour later? What was to be done? Should he abandon his intention— because of this mischance. 
rage against his brother-in-law ate into his heart. All had promised so well. Everything was moving with such smoothness till Quorm appeared. What but a malevolent mind could have brought this fellow back from Brimps to cross him? What was to be done? It was of no practical use storming against Jason. Should he abandon his purpose, or defer it? To abandon it seemed to him an impossibility. By carrying it out alone, he could be released from his present pecuniary difficulty. To defer it was difficult, for he wanted immediate relief. Moreover, when again could he calculate on having the ground so clear as now, his wife away in Tymouth, his niece waiting at a distance with the cart? What if Jason had seen him? Would he dare to give evidence against him, his own brother-in-law? Was it not to Jason's interest that he, Pasco, should be flush in money and ready to embark on the proposed scheme of erecting a sawmill? Even if Jason spoke of having seen him, he could deny it. Pasco sprang from the settle. He would run the risk. It was worth it. End of chapter 32